Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us, and we will be starting uh, in a few moments. Good morning, everybody. If you're just joining us, we'll be starting in a few moments. All right, I think we're uh, we're good to go. So uh, first of all, hello, and uh, my name is uh, Chris Kilford, and I'm the president of the Canadian International Council branch here on Vancouver Island. I'd like to welcome our Canadian International Council members and our guests, and of course our panelists, who I'll introduce a little later on. But we have uh, Bassam Al Kuwaitli in Istanbul, so it's much later in the evening. Uh, well, it's late in the evening there, and, and uh, Stephen Hyten in Kingston, and Sabina Lair here in Victoria. So welcome, uh, panelists. And before we officially get underway, it's important to recognize that uh, CIC Victoria members live, work, and learn on the unceded Coast, Coast Salish uh, territory. And we give thanks to the Lekwungen people, now known, as, now known as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, for allowing us to meet on their traditional lands uh, today. For those of you that are not familiar with the Canadian International Council, we are an independent, nonpartisan uh, think tank with an express mandate to engage Canadians in uh, global issues. And I think what makes us different from many think tanks in Canada is that uh, besides our headquarters in Toronto, we have 18 branches across the country with some 1,400 members who are you know, deeply, um, deeply interested uh, with, with Canada's role in the world. And you can find more about us by Googling the Canadian International Council. We also have a CIC Victoria Facebook page. And if you're not a member of the Canadian International Council, please um, consider joining us and I'll, um, Put my uh, email address in the in the in the chat later on, so that you can contact me if you like. You know, just here on Vancouver Island, we have 430 members in our branch, with over 100 of them uh, being students at the universities in in the local area. So, how we're going to uh, handle today, because we do have 90 minutes, um, we will um, have uh, after introductions, our panelists speak for 10 to 15 minutes, and then an audience Q and A. And I'm sure most. Most of you are used to this now, so if you do have questions for our panelists, use the Q&A function uh, down below at the bottom of your screen. We are recording this event as well for those that couldn't make it. And I'm also delighted to say that four of our CIC Victoria members will be randomly chosen after this event is over, and they will receive a copy of uh, Stephen's uh, new book, Reaching Mythamina, which is just, I've got them just over my shoulder here, so they, they're there, and they'll be coming out to, to you after this event for the lucky folks that, that uh, are chosen. And we'll also be making from CIC Victoria a $500 donation to the Intercultural Association of uh, Greater Victoria. So, that's all out of the way and let's move on to the event itself. Now, I'm sure uh, as many of you know that in March 2011, a serious government led by President Bashar al-Assad faced an unprecedented challenge to its authority when pro-democracy protests erupted throughout the country. Now, protesters were demanding an end to the authoritarian practices of his regime and in return, uh, the government uh, resorted to violence to suppress these protests. Now here we are, 10 years later, uh, having seen the full effects of what a civil war can do. Bashar al-Assad is still in power. Some 500,000 Syrians have been killed, close to 6 million are refugees, while another 6 million in the country have been displaced. Closer to home, nearly 73,000 Syrian refugees have been resettled in Canada since 2015. And speaking for myself, from July 2011 to July 2014, I also happened to be on the ground in Turkey when serving as our Canadian defense attache at our embassy in Ankara. And I had a front row seat as I watched things develop across the border in Syria. So I'm actually really delighted uh, to be able to bring this panel together to address what's an incredibly important issue. And as I mentioned, 
We have Bassam in Istanbul, Stephen in Kingston, and Sabina in Victoria. So let me introduce them, and then they will speak each for 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll move on to a, an audience Q&A. So first of all, Bassam. Bassam is a Syrian-Canadian national, born in Bulgaria, and currently living in Turkey. He is the founder of the Syrian Liberal Party, Arar, and is part of its current leadership. He holds an MA in Conflict Analysis and Management from Royal Roads University here in Victoria and studied immigration law and computer science previously. Currently, he is the managing director of RMT Team, a research company working in the Middle East, uh, North Africa region, um, or the MENA, mainly in conflict countries. Next, uh, we have Stephen Hyten, whose most recent books are Reaching Mithmina Among the Volunteers and Refugees on Lesbos, which was a finalist for the Writers' Trust Hillary Weston Prize. And he also has a children's book drawing on the same events called The Stray and the Strangers, which I also happen to have a copy of as well. His poetry collection, The uh, Waking Comes Late, received the 2016 Governor General's Award for Poetry, and his short fiction and poetry have received four gold national magazine awards. In April 2021, uh, which is now, of course, uh, his selected poems, 1983 to 2020, will be published. And Wolf Island Records will release his first album, The Devil's Share, which I had a chance to listen to one of the tracks uh, uh, to yesterday. And finally, Sabina. Sabina Lair is private sponsorship of Refugees Manager with the Intercultural Association of Greater Victoria. And she also serves as the chair of the Council of Canadian Refugee Sponsorship Agreement Holders Association, and has previously been a member of the Executive Committee of the Canadian Council for Refugees. She has been an NGO delegate at the annual tripartite, tripartite consultations on resettlement for the past four years, and has served as an advisor to the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative to assist other countries who are exploring refugee sponsorship schemes. Sabina holds a Master's of Business Administration degree in International Management from the University of London, a PhD from the University of Victoria in Educational Studies, and a Postgraduate Certificate in Refugee and Forced Migration Studies from York University. So thank you our, uh, to our panelists for joining us today. And Bassam, I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Chris, uh, for the great introduction. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending this event. Uh, many people, when they talk about Syria and the current events happening in Syria, they go back to 2011. I'll go briefly beyond that just to explain the background of what's happening, why we are here in the first place. So uh, when the Ottoman Empire fell and uh, everybody was looking to divide the spoils of the Ottoman Empire, in Syria there have been attempts to establish a constitutional monarchy. Actually, a constitution was written in 1920. Uh, a king was there, a parliament uh, did gather. Uh, so all the attempts were happening to create a real democratic system, which for the time was constitutional monarchy. This was actually destroyed uh, when the League of Nations decided to divide the area between Britain and France into mandates. And uh, Syria at the time was divided into two days, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine, uh, slash Israel. Uh, and the dream of independence and democracy was destroyed. Now, the second attempt for democracy was uh, did start in 1947 when the French army withdrew from Syria. Uh, unfortunately, this did not last for long. 1949, Syria had first military coup supported by the US. Uh, and uh, that was part of the Cold War events which were happening in many third world countries, South America, uh, Middle East, and, and so on. Uh, now, basically, Syria had since then had very short periods of democracy, but uh, was mainly governed by military, uh, which uh, went through until 1963, when a military coup with the Ba'ath Party, which is still ruling till today, 
uh, happen. Uh, now, what differentiates 1963, basically, uh, military coup? Number one, it was led by a political party. Before that, it wasn't. It, it was individual military officers. Uh, number two, it was led by minority officers. Uh, now, as men I'm mentioning this as a historical fact, not as a way to uh, demonize anybody, of course. Uh, now, what happened from 1963 to 1970, when Assad, which were, was part of the officers taking over the country in 1963, is the circle, sectarian circle narrowed. So basically, uh, other officers from different minorities than the Alawite minority were dismissed slowly, slowly, even though some of them participated in the first coup. Uh, until basically uh, only Alawite officers or mostly Alawite officers led the country. Uh, I'm highlighting this because there's always there's this sectarian element to the governance in Syria. Uh, and not sectarian in meaning that it serves the sects, no, but it utilizes the sect to rule uh, the Alawite sect, which is a minority, to rule over the whole country. Uh, now, slowly, slowly, since 1970, the circle narrowed, so even the uh, the, the Assad started relying mostly on part of the sect, which is uh, his tribe basically within the sect, then into the family. So you started to see that uh, uh, the presidential guards are led by his son, which is, I think, common in most third world countries, led by dictators, uh, and so on. So the circle really narrowed to a family rule under uh, utilizing this broader circle was the sect and then utilizing the bad party, which is ruling the country. Uh, I'm mentioning this because that explains a lot of things which happened in uh, 2011. Uh, by the way, in 1979, we had similar events for a shorter period where uh, uh, the unions went on strike, lawyers union, engineering unions, uh, everybody requesting democracy for the country. Uh, and they were crushed, uh, imprisoned, and so on. And the conflict all of a sudden in 1980 turned into a, a sectarian when the Muslim Brotherhood started uh, uh, attacks on, uh, against the regime and mutual attacks ended with 1982 destruction of the city of Hama with 20,000 civilians killed. Uh, so uh, basically in 2011, when the people went out demanding democracy, uh, the, the model of 1979-1980 was still present uh, among the government apparatus. So it, it resorted to trying to turn the, the pro-democracy movement and the conflict, which was basically demanding freedoms, into a sectarian conflict, because this will galvanize uh, minorities in Syria around uh, the regime, will put the opposition as being Sunni, uh, and will lead basically to its isolation slowly, slowly. Unfortunately, the regime succeeded to big part in, in this plan. Uh, a lot of our friends, which were part of the nonviolent movement, the nonviolent resistance, were uh, arrested, killed, uh, disappeared, while at the same time, Islamic militants were released out of prison. Same Islamic militants, which Assad was sending before to Iraq to fight against the Americans, Al Qaeda operatives, and so on. So the whole conflict turned into sectarian, and we ended with the refugee situation we have now. Uh, now, the number of killed, our assumptions, is much more than 500,000. UN stopped counting in 2014. There were around 400 at the time. There are hundreds of thousands of disappear, disappeared people uh, as well, which nobody knows where they are. And most likely, people slowly, slowly are getting death certificates. Uh, so the number, uh, the assumption is the number could be anywhere from 700,000 to a million people. Nobody knows until maybe, uh, maybe never, unfortunately. Uh, now, in terms of refugees, uh, we have 6.6 uh, uh, .6 million uh, outside of the country, internally displayed around 6.2 million. And in Turkey, the part I'm going to be speaking about is 3.6 million. Uh, now, it's very important to highlight that during the war as well, attempts for demographic change started by different actors, mainly Iran trying to get a line of uh, continuous connection between its presence in Iraq and Lebanon, Hezbollah areas, uh, Baalbek area, the northern, uh, northern Lebanon. So basically, you find the line from the Iraqi borders across central Syria, homes to al Qusayr, which is on the Lebanese border, there is a lot of displacement happening 
uh, to try to substitute the population uh, for Shia population. Sometimes it's not substitution, sometimes it's attempts of conversion, religious conversion. Uh, so Iran trying to basically uh, entrench itself in Syria beyond its military capabilities. So even if Iran is pushed out, uh, there are realities on the ground which are hard to change back. Uh, now, in terms of Turkey, uh, the official numbers are around 3.6 million refugees. Assumptions are around 4 million, uh, taking in mind that there's some certain percentage is not re necessarily registered. Uh, now, a majority or absolute majority, around 98% of refugees in Turkey live within the host communities, in cities, towns, villages, and so on. And a very small number, around 2%, lives in some types of temporary accommodation centers. There were camps, uh, a lot of them get dismantled, actually, very few are left. Uh, which which is actually plays very good for the Syrian population, in a way. Uh, because it allows them to mingle among the normal population, learn the language, move around, uh, try to find jobs with many obstacles, which we'll talk about. Uh, now, the main issue Syrian refugees uh, face in Turkey, uh, actually, let me go back a little bit that Turkey is signatory to 1951 uh, uh, refugee uh, convention but it's not signatory to 1967 protocol related to the status of refugees, which is actually removing the geographic limitations. 1951 defined refugees as those coming from Europe, 1951 convention. Uh, the protocol expanded this to include anybody from anywhere around the world. So Turkey did not sign this, which means that Syrian, what we are calling Syrian refugees are not actually refugees in Turkey. They don't have the status. In the beginning, they were called guests, uh, received, by the way, with a great hospitality among, especially the community, not, not only government. The community was really accepting them very well, welcoming them very well. Now, later on, the uh, 2013, the government introduced a protection law to give Syrian uh, refugees some kind of status. So now they are under protection. Uh, but the problem with this is not really uh, as strong as the refugee, doesn't have, uh, uh, as the ref being a refugee in other countries, doesn't have really, it could be removed at any time, changed. It's, it's not, it doesn't give the security which many Syrians want. Um, and uh, as a result of this as well, uh, many Syrians uh, and not being able to work legally in Turkey. Uh, there's, uh, as well, it's very important to talk that the Turkish government initially was thinking that those refugees will go back to Syria. Now we're starting to see change in, in this uh, uh, feeling that, oh, OK, those are here to stay. They are not going to go back. There are no conditions for them go, to go back. Uh, a lot of them already have families here, life, uh, so on. Uh, resolution in Syria is not coming soon anyhow, and even if issues of the war stop today, uh, conditions are not going to change maybe in another 5, 10, 20 years, God knows, uh, similar to Iraq. Uh, so basically, that's uh, initial attitude of Syria being here just on a temporary basis is starting to adapt. This doesn't need to change. Among most political parties, but still, unfortunately, uh, Syrian um, presence in Turkey plays a big role in elections. So uh, political parties, a lot of time, compete on uh, appeasing to the voters, uh, uh, especially now after uh, 10 years of the war, there's, uh, the population started to feel fatigue. Uh, of the Syrian presence. It uh, went much longer than they expected. Uh, there's uh, with the economic, slight economic decline, which is happening now as well, there's feeling that Syrians are competing for jobs with the Turkish population, uh, especially in low end jobs, because the majority of Syrians don't have work permits. I think the numbers were there are around 30,000 work permits. So you would assume that all the rest are working without any really legal cover. And naturally, they will not compete uh, as being doctors and lawyers and engineers. They compete on uh, small jobs uh, with the poorest of the poor uh, of the Turkish population. 
so political parties, uh, we go back to political parties basically compete during elections a lot of times on Syrians need to go back, we need to find a solution to the Syrian issue, still a hot issue uh, in Turkish uh, politics, unfortunately. Uh, now, uh, Turkey gets some financial support from other countries, especially EU. Uh, EU uh, signed agreements with Turkey to guarantee uh, a return of refugees which come from Turkey, especially after the big waves which went to Germany, Sweden, uh, and other countries. Uh, so in exchange, they give some financial support. In my estimation, uh, the number is six billion, but in my, my estimation, that's not closely enough really to deal with the with, uh, Syrian refugee situation. Uh, this needs much more funding, especially that when you fund refugees, you need to take care of the local community as well, which hosts them. You cannot uh, give uh, build a nice school for uh, Syrian students and ignore the Turkish students, which might be going to older school. So uh, the burden on the Turkish government is high uh, in terms of taking care of the refugees. Uh, it needs more support. Uh, to do so. Uh, uh, now, most refugees uh, basically in Turkey uh, started, it, it, initially when they came for a long period, many resisted to learn Turkish language or anything, thinking they're going to be here temporarily. Now we started to see change in attitudes. Basically, people are thinking, okay, that's not going to be temporary, it's going to be longer term. So you started to see a, a, a change in behavior and approach. But this change as well is faced with, uh, let's put it this way, uh, maybe lack of systems of integration in Turkey. Uh, Turkey is not used to those huge waves of immigration, similar size of the Syrian uh, population. That's uh, almost 5% of its population. Turkey is 80 million, uh, 4 million Syrian refugees, almost 5% uh, in terms of numbers, which is huge. Uh, Turkey had before the few smaller waves, the Bulgarian Turks in 86, I think, and then a wave of Serbian uh, uh, population. Of course, historically had many more uh, Circassians and others, but I'm talking about uh, in, uh, closer times. Uh, so there is lack of systemized approach for integration. Uh, no, uh, so, so so for example, when a refugee arrives to Germany, there's a system there, they go to uh, German language schooling, then they get to job centers, the job placement, they get the residency which allows them to work, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, here in Turkey, there's a lot of uh, small uh, efforts, but they are not connected together. If you need to learn la Turkish language, you have to go around and try to find somewhere. There's no immigrant centers where you can go and find out help for everything. Uh, multitude of NGOs as well try to help. There's, of course, the Turkish IHH and other uh, big uh, players, but there as well a lot of international actors uh, which uh, try to assist and help, but again, most, uh, and Syrian NGOs as well, but most of this is not very well coordinated, unfortunately. And a lot of time you find repetition, waste, uh, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, and now, uh, of course, I say that not to uh, undermine what all the effort which is, uh, or underestimate all the efforts which has been put in Turkey, for example, uh, in the first period of time, Syrian children went to temporary schools supported by NGOs. Uh, later stage, they were all integrated into Turkish schools. But you still see a lot of Syrian children collecting uh, recycling materials from garbage, uh, uh, are not helped for economic reasons, and so on. Uh, so all this, uh, I, I think I crossed my time, right, Chris? Okay, I'm trying to cut short. You're doing great. You're doing great. Um, yeah, I didn't we time can, We can hold here. Yeah. So we basically, can hold here. perfect. Uh, so basically, uh, so Sam, need, uh, you can bring. We'll have plenty of time and. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Two. Great. So key issues will come out in the Q&A. 
you bring me to like, for example, uh, when I arrived in Turkey in 2011, it was at the sort of beginnings of the Arab Spring, and we were watching events in Syria. And in July 2012, I had an opportunity to visit the refugee camp in Kilis on the Syrian border that Turkey had set up. And it was you know, a fantastic camp. I mean, unbelievable services were in place, a hospital with a pharmacy and schools and all sorts of um, support was there. I think if I recall, that camp was built for about 30,000 refugees. And we were with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs representative from the Turkish government. And uh, so it's July, 2012, and there were some refugees there. But at that time, I remember the representative saying, we don't think this camp will ever reach capacity because Bashar al-Assad will be gone and uh, this will all be over. And of course, it never worked out like that. And that brings me to, to Stephen, because from 2011, 2012, 2013, we just saw more and more people coming in. And then Stephen finds himself in 2015 on the, the island of uh, Lesbos. And so, Stephen, I'll turn the floor over to you. Sure. Okay. I, I'm going to uh, read um, a passage from my book that's set in the notorious Camp Moria, uh, which no longer exists. It was destroyed by fire in September. Oh, I'm losing track of time now. It was September 2020. Uh, it was uh, finally destroyed. Uh, there were, shortly before its destruction, there were 24,000 refugees in that camp. It was about 25 acres which most people reckon made it the most densely populated human settlement on earth. Now, when I was there, the passage I'm gonna to read to you, I was there in December, 2015. Uh, I worked mainly in other places and other camps, uh, volunteer run camps. I went to Moria for one day on my way out, coming back to Canada and just helped out for one day. There were 3000 people there that day and I, I couldn't imagine how it could have been any more crowded or chaotic. Anyway, I'll get to that in a moment. I just want to tell you how I came to be there um, on Lesbos. Uh, basically, in the fall of 2015, I was hard at work on a novel called The Nightingale Won't Let You Sleep. It was a novel that concerned um, fictional Mediterranean refugees on the island of Cyprus. These would have been Greek, uh, Greek Cypriots, Turkish Cypriots living together in a kind of village in the heart of a deserted city called Varosha. Um, I was hard at work on this book and I thought it was going okay and I was interested in it, but in light of what was happening um, on the ground in Lesbos uh, increasingly in 2015, as more as, as these enormous waves of mainly Syrian refugees, but also uh, Iraqi, Afghan, uh, some Iranian people, some Palestinians, they were all coming across to Lesbos and trying to move on to Europe. I think most of them were aiming at Northern Europe, definitely. Uh, at any rate, um, in light of what was happening there on Lesbos, my fictional enterprise suddenly seemed um, frivolous and irrelevant. And I was suddenly seized by this impulse to actually do something concrete, to go to Greece and do something. Uh, one thing that inclined me to do that is my mother was Greek uh, and um, I actually had also had a Turkish relative a long way back, a great, great, great grandfather. And so I felt a sort of affinity for that part of the world, strong affinity. I also thought the little bit of Greek I knew, it's not very good, but I thought it might be helpful. I, I could, you know, I knew the foreign volunteers there that wouldn't speak Greek. And so I thought I might be helpful as a liaison. That turned out to be totally untrue. My, my Greek was not <laughs> up to it at all. Um, and I just thought, you know, I, I've got two strong hands. I'll go and pitch in and just do what I can because for once I want to do something concrete. And as I say, working on that fictional uh, piece while this was happening just sort of brought to light how I was living a very artificial uh, life. And, and I thought, of course, as one does, when you get ideas like this, oh, I'll never do it. It's not convenient. I have other things that I have to do over the next month or two, and I'll have to cancel them all. Um, and I have to finish this novel. But in the end, I, basically overnight, I made a decision. I, I had some vivid dreams that seemed to be the kind of dreams that aren't nonsense. They seem instructional. They seem to be delivering a verdict. And uh, the next day I got up and started looking for tickets to Greece, which were very cheap for a number of reasons. It was November. Also, the tourist industry in Lesbos had been destroyed by the refugee crisis because uh, close to a million 
uh, mainly Syrian refugees had crossed to Lesbos that year. And, uh, and so of course, um, tourists had stopped going. So within a couple of days, I was on Lesbos and almost immediately joined uh, with, a, I, I knew they needed volunteers. So I didn't pre-join with any volunteer organization. I just showed up as I was told I could do. And sure enough, uh, the very night I, I got there, I was put to work um, in the harbor of Molivos, which I call Mithimna in the book, uh, where uh, refugees were being brought in by the Greek Coast Guard because their rafts had been sinking. Um, so sometimes I worked in the harbor where we were you know, dry clothes and checking passports from arriving Sir mainly Syrian refugees. Sometimes I worked in a little volunteer run camp called Oxy which the NGOs on the island eventually closed down because it was they felt it was too disorganized, which by the way it was, but the NGOs were disorganized too. There were 70 uh, NGOs and volunteers all working together uh, on the island. And so the chain of command was really confused and things were very disorganized. As Bassam was saying, a uh, real organization problem, but like him, I don't really blame uh, I don't blame, I certainly don't blame the volunteers. I also don't really blame the NGOs, even though personally I found them kind of difficult to work with at times, sometimes pulling rank, arrogant. At the same time, they were doing their best and the situation simply was chaotic. Okay, so what I wanna do is just read you about an eight minute passage uh, set in Camp Moria. Now this is a few days before Christmas, 2015. I'm going to start in the middle of the scene. So to set it up for you, I've been, <clears throat> I was helping out at a clothing tent till I got kicked out because I wasn't able to control the gate where people were coming in to get dry clothes. They were cold and hypothermic, so they were pushing past me. I didn't blame them. Um, but I wasn't, uh, you know, assertive or aggressive enough to stop them. So they said, get out of here, Steve, go help out somewhere else. Um, so uh, I, I come up, uh, upon a group of Syrian kids playing soccer outside the kinder kinder tent. I play soccer with them for a while and then the soccer ball skitters off toward a huddle of volunteers and I race one of the boys to it, trapping it under my soul and rolling it back to him. My little sprint has brought me to the huddle. A young Scotsman with a dashing ridge of black hair, heroic stubble, and a leather coat with sheepskin trim is briefing the others. On the far side of Afghan Hill, a riot squad is preparing to push back the Syrians who have been waiting all day to register. The situation is serious. I have to run a few steps every dozen or so to keep up with him and the others. Moria volunteers are adept at dodging throngs like the ones now flowing downhill against us. I keep losing sight of our leader, his white sheepskin collar. The sun is setting behind the stripped pillage olive trees and the enormous tent city. So remember there were 3000 people in the camp at that point and a thousand had arrived early that morning and were now lined up waiting to register. Um, we regroup outside the high fenced compound. Inside, back of the chain link gates, officials stand scowling and smoking at, uh, at the registration tables. Why are no refugees being allowed to register? A dozen riot cops with transparent shields stand looking out through the fence at the pressing crowd. Crowd, not queue. The pressure of a thousand distressed people edging forward has created a dense swelling at the front where folks are not so much pushing as being pushed against the locked gates. Maybe 500 are packed into a mass there, while a tapering comet tail of others recedes far behind, disappearing over the hill. The young Scotsman explains that the cops are refusing to admit anyone until the crowd forms two lines, one for families, one for single men, because they want to register families first and settle them inside the compound for safety's sake overnight. But there are no Arabic translators today, so the head cop has been bullhorning the orders in English and Greek. Now he wants the volunteers to try to convey his orders. <clears throat> we got to move these people back into two lines or the goon squad means to charge. They give us 20 minutes. Um, that's actually the volunteer speaking, not the Greek cop. He offers several Arabic phrases to me, though his tentative delivery suggests he's repeating them phonetically maybe incorrectly, and they're very much incorrectly. As the floodlights brighten above the gate, dusk falling fast, the police chief starts broadcasting with the megaphone again. We split up and hurry along the edges of the crowd, urging people to move back and separate into two lines by pointing and using the phrase Wahit Ayala, supposedly Arabic for one family. 
A face from Eftalu Beach looms into focus. Uh, here I just described seeing a refugee I met earlier on Eftalu Beach. Now a dignified little man with a white goatee, maybe a retired school teacher, asks how much longer they will have to wait. We stand eight hour and no toilet. The toilets are inside the fence. Please move back, I say, and ask him to tell the others about the lines. Wait, can you come to the front with me to translate, I ask him. If I move back or front, I lose my place, maybe wait all night. I shake my head, no, yet it could be true. Please, I say. I must stay in line, he says. Then tell the others here, okay? Two lines. Why you treat us like we are not people? I'm sorry, I mutter, unable to move his eyes as I move on. That amplified reverbing voice keeps hectoring the Syrians in English and Greek. And now, and now some of the, uh, sorry, keeps hectoring the Syrians in Greek and English. And now some of them begin yelling back. And in moments, the yelling starts to cohere into a pounding chant. I and a couple of other volunteers are working maybe 100 meters from the gates back where the queue actually is a queue and the people seem less des desperate as if they only just arrived. They're politely retreating and forming a single file, though this minor adjustment seems unlikely to relieve the crush at the front. Thank God, says a volunteer behind me. I glance toward the gates. They're swinging inward, surely to admit refugees. Yet the echoing voice keeps ordering, back, back, move back now. An awful shudder runs through the crowd. The Arabic chant intensifies. Then there's another faster beat, a contra rhythm, maybe the cops smashing their truncheons on their shields. What I can see is the white tops of their helmets glinting in the floodlight, pushing out through the gates in a single rank. I run toward the front, glimpse the police chief standing to one side, gaping, the megaphone hanging from his hand. I start toward him. A woman steps out of the crowd and blocks me. Monsieur, parlez-vous français? She doesn't wait for an answer, but starts explaining in loud but leisurely French. Speak faster, I want to beg her, that she's searching for her husband and son. She's very pregnant, a pert, girlish face. Arcs of light draw my gaze up over her head, truncheons scything the air above the crowd and flailing down, hands shooting up. The chant dissolves into screams as the mob dissolves, exploding in all directions, hundreds of people with blank, blind eyes. The woman and I are in their path. Facing me, she can't see them coming. She's on a shore with her back turned to a tsunami, but she sees my eyes, looks behind her. I grab her elbow, go, go, go. Together we're running, the furious slapping of hundreds of shoes closing in. She rips free of me and, somehow unhindered by her belly and long tunic, pulls ahead. I realize I'm slowing down on purpose, men bolting past on either side, my instinct now to walk with planted steps, extend my arms, brace for impact. My God, this is happening. The ones overtaking me are slowing too, the mob momentum and panic subsiding as fast as it erupted. I stop and turn around. Many who were fleeing just a moment ago have reversed and seem equally frantic to reclaim positions near the front, even if it means facing the cops again. No sign of the woman. From somewhere, the shrilling of a whistle blown over and over. I run back toward the front of the crowd. Who knows what I'm thinking, what I hope I can possibly achieve. With other volunteers, I stand perpendicular to the battlefront between the cops and the Syrians, all men, many of them young. Again, that shattering needle sharp whistle blast after blast. Somewhere the chief is babbling a stream of Greek words through the megaphone. The cops in their Cylon body armor pound their clubs against their shields or use their shields to bump back refugees while threatening with the clubs. The features of the stout little cop nearest me a few steps away clench and contort, teeth gritted under his dapper mustache as he tries in his terror to terrify this mob, also terrified into backing off. In garbled English, he brays, go pack, go pack, go pack, and bulges his eyes. It's like a rugby hacker with far higher stakes. My, thrillings, my throat swells closed for a second. Then I and a few others are calling, stop it, stop this. And in Greek, siga, siga, I means slowly, slowly, go easy. The cops hear nothing, their peripheral hearing and vision voided, battle brain. A small volunteer dressed like a goth is sobbing and I put my arm around her and shudder and shoulder. 
around her arm around her shoulder. She was shuddering. The frontline Syrians cry out and gesticulate, eyes petitioning, eyes indignant. They must want to retreat before these armored men, like the armed men they fled in Syria. Yet they must want to hold their ground and not lose their place in line, not lose any more time. Their wills lean in only one direction, forward, through lineups and across borders, even as the borders ahead of them start to close. To be forced backward here, even 50 steps, is agony. Yet to fight the local authorities might be fatal to the dream. So now they do start to withdraw, 10 steps, 20, until the impulse spreads through the crowd and they're all re retreating steadily. We walk back along the queue, mainly single men now, urging them to move back. Arjuk, Arjuk, Shukran. I have no idea if that's proper. That's what we were taught to say. And I, I know it didn't sound right to them, but they understood, uh, move back, please, Shukran. Beyond the queue, under the fence beside the gates, another group is congregating, families, most of them already seated, either in submission, more likely in exhausted relief. Those maddening whistle blasts start up again, and now I see a small boy wandering on the periphery of the seated group, tooting a whistle. But the megaphone is silent. The cops are silent. A collective response is kicked in. The mass of us, refugees, volunteers, cops, instinctively collaborating to de-escalate and pacify. A man wearing a space blanket like a poncho, having cut a hole for his head, grips my hand. While he is frail, the identical twin behind him, leaning on a steel cane, is cadaverous. Friend, you look, says the man, kneeling and lifting the hems of his brother's black jeans above geri geriatric shoes with Velcro tabs. Instead of shins, he has thin metal pe pegs. Ten hours he waits. Where is their water? I lead them to the front of the queue and approach the police chief, his cap pushed back off his streaming brow. The skin around his eyes has that bruised Levantine look, though his eyes are not the usual brown, but a pale liquid green. Despite his glower and the uniform, he looks vulnerable, a grieving son at the end of a funeral. Beautiful, lugubrious eyes. I gesture toward the man with the cane and speak in fractured Greek. The chief cuts me off in English. It does not matter where he stands. We will not begin this line for three more hours. An armored cop behind him adds something in Greek and a second later, I get it, or six more hours. Still, I take the man and his brother to the front where the others nod, make room and welcome him in subdued voices. I haven't the heart to say nothing of the words to explain about the long wait in store. So that's a sunset, my one day in Camp Moria, 3,000 people soon to be 20,000. So. Thank you, uh, Stephen, for that very personal experience that you've just communicated with us. And that uh, runs through the whole book. I, I thought the book was, was really insightful. And, and uh, it just shows you how people who are fleeing a desperate situation in Syria, making their way through Turkey, where often they weren't, uh, they were very, I mean, they are very well looked after in Turkey, but the, those that were fleeing were at the mercy of, of the people that were sending them across that stretch of water with life jackets that weren't life jackets and boats that wouldn't float and, and then showing up in Greece. Um, it, it, it is, it's quite, quite horrible. And we, we witnessed that and it seems like a long time ago, but, but here we are today and in Canada, We've taken in quite a number of uh, Syrian refugees, uh, as I've mentioned. We um, uh, haven't had 3.6 million Syrian refugees descend upon us. We haven't had a million in the case of some, you know, in the case of Germany and so forth. But still, 73,000 is a considerable number. And from everything I've read, um, we've done a very good job about integrating uh, Syrian refugees into the country, as we do for all of the people that come here from all over the world. It's, it's part of our national fabric, I guess. Um, but for more on that, I'm going to talk, turn to uh, Sabina here in, uh, in Victoria to talk more about uh, how that Canadian experience has unfolded. So Sabina, over to you. 
Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, and thank you for the introductions. And of course, also your great support, the CSE support of uh, the Intercultural Association. We really appreciate that. Thanks uh, to Bassam and Stephen for setting the stage here and telling us a little bit of what was going on in other parts of the world uh, where surrogates were trying to get to safety in those days. So I'll bring us back into Canada. I'll bring us back into Victoria. I have a couple of slides. So Chris is going to uh, run that for me at his end if you could load the slides. Thank you, Chris. So what I want to talk about is the Operation Syrian Refugees, as it became to be known. Uh, this was a, a name that the government of Canada coined, so OSR, we often say. So six years later, started in 2015, now we are in 2021. Next slide. So just a little bit of a recap, what Operation Syrian Refugees was. Uh, it was also known as at Welcome Refugees, which was the hashtag that the government of Canada used at the time. Um, it comprised about 100 days from November 2015 to the end of February 2016, during which more than 25,000 Syrians were resettled to Canada. Uh, my figure here of 44,620 resettled by end of October is a bit different from Chris's, but I think maybe Chris, you are including uh, the in Canada claims that were made. So that's just the resettlement numbers here. So we can chat later about the numbers, but I'm thinking that maybe you're including the also the in Canada claims of Syrians that were made. And of course, there were also quite a few of those. So of those um, 44,000 here, just over 44,000, it was sort of an almost even split between government assisted refugees. So those that were basically sponsored by the government of Canada to come to Canada and uh, privately sponsored refugees, which is, of course, the program that I'm working in on a day to day basis. And they fall into two categories. There is a fairly large program of refugees where the sponsors are able to name those refugees for sponsorship to Canada. And then the smaller blended visa office referred program. Uh, those are refugees that are referred by the UN Refugee Agency for sponsorship by Canada. Next slide. So here is a little snapshot. Um, this is a, a map that the government produced where they plotted uh, the, the refugees, uh, the certain refugees that had come to Canada. It is static as of the end of January 2017. These um, the stats are no longer being updated on a regular basis, but I just thought I'd include it because it shows really well how this was a coast-to-coast a -coast effort and not just coast-to-coast, -coast, but also southern to northern border because we can see here that even even uh, places like Whitehorse and Yellowknife received refugees at the time. Obviously not the same numbers as in the greater Toronto area or further out west, you know, Alberta and, and Vancouver and, and also on the island here, but uh, certainly there were refugees going there. Um, next slide. So what, what was um, OSR? Um, OSR um, was a, an operation that uh, was born, you know, out of a, a very short, like, planning stage. And so it felt in many ways also chaotic. Also, uh, you know, hearing from Stephen what things looked like uh, in, in Greece at the time and on some of the islands, it's nothing in comparison. But, you know, from where we were sitting, uh, it was, uh, you know, something that, that felt at times quite chaotic. So the government was trying to prepare us here in, in the sector, in the resettlement sector as best as they could. So there were these profiles that had been shared with stakeholders, for example, which then turned out to be actually quite inaccurate in some respects. Um, so not all of what we had been told in advance was, uh, you know, really what we saw on the ground as people started to arrive. So for example, about these profiles, what we saw was that people had much higher needs than had originally been anticipated um, and lower educational levels than had been, uh, that had been in profiled in, in these documents that we were given. So there were, there were some disconnect there, but uh, you know, we, we quickly adjusted. Um, we found it very important to have 
proper coordinated support of everything that was going on in this operation. So of course, part of the operation was funded and another part was not. And so in, in the funded operation, you know, here at ICA, uh, we became a uh, not just a sponsorship agreement holder to work with, uh, with refugees that came through sponsorship to Canada, but also a resettlement assistance program provider for the government assisted um, refugees. And so that government assisted program is is of course funded by the government so there were staff that quickly uh, got in place um, and to look after that operation uh, on the volunteer side of things that that i'm coordinating and with the many many sponsors that that helped us the many many canadians that came forward and said we want to help we want to help with the integration of these refugees uh, it was more difficult you know to do the coordination because it is it is an unfunded uh, program by definition and as i showed you <laughs> There were just as many people coming through that program as through the funded program. So kind of putting all these coordinations into place um, and, and harnessing, you know, the, 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 the willingness of ordinary Canadians to become involved, that was quite a bit of a challenge. Um, so in terms of the, the income supports that people received when they arrived here, all of the refugees that are being resettled to Canada are being supported for one full year. So again, you know, on the uh, on the government assisted side, uh, it was all done through funded agencies. So we here at ICA were making sure that, that these monies were being paid out to the refugees that came through the government program. And of course, on the private side, it is all the work of private sponsors. It is all people that fundraised uh, and, and, you know, took on enormous uh, fundraising initiatives to get the monies together very quickly to resettle this this large number of people in a relatively short period of time. Um, barriers that we all encountered in in this, uh, whether it was the funded side or you know the volunteer side, uh, was finding housing. You know, on very short notice um, for for a significant number of people in a you know in many communities that have very high housing prices. That includes, of course, Victoria, but also many other places across Canada some of the major metropolitan areas. Um, the language barrier. So as I said, you know, people didn't necessarily come with the levels of English or French uh, that had been, uh, you know, indicated in these profiles that we received. So many people came with very little English, and some people were actually not uh, very literate in their own in their own native language. So that was certainly a barrier. And that, of course, relates to employment, you know, how are people able to find employment if they if they're still struggling with the language? medical and dental issues was also something that we saw a lot um, in terms of barriers that people experienced and, and having very urgent needs that needed to be looked after upon arrival. Uh, next slide. So as I said, language um, is really important to unlock the doors to a new community and to interact with the world around oneself. And so that was very much a focus from the start. So I'm showing you here a bit of a snapshot of the various types of, of supports uh, for different stories of support that were put in place um, here by ICA. So on the lower left, you see uh, a classroom. This is a formal uh, government of Canada funded class. So for uh, LINK is called, which stands for Language Instruction for Newcomers to Canada. So all of the refugees that came had priority access to these classes, and we try to get them in as fast as possible. In the upper right uh, corner there, you see a volunteer that is uh, working here with ICA, working one on one with a newcomer outside of the classroom to give them some extra supports. In the lower right, you can see uh, an English conversation class that is organized by us uh, during one of the scheduled breaks of the regular classes so that newcomers could get some more practice you know while they were on on a break and then in the upper left here you see the logo for our ICA collaboration uh, with Google through the we speak translate program and app I know that some of you probably have come across that in the community so many of our sponsors that were working in the private sponsorship program but also community organizations and businesses took that up 
you might see that sticker somewhere out in the community. I, I've seen it a lot, you know, when I go, I know my pharmacy has it and, and several other places, um, basically to interact with people that, that do not uh, speak the English language in a way that they can, can interact sufficiently. Next slide. So, as I said, the, the language and the ability to speak the language also is very much linked to and opens the door to employment opportunities. Uh, and that, of course, is very important for people, uh, even during the first year, they think a lot about what's going to happen in the second year, it puts a lot of stress on people as they arrive. Um, and so many of them start thinking very early on about how can they, you know, earn a living in the second year once their supports, their official um, monetary supports end. So um, we at ICA have a number of programs uh, that we put in place, some were specifically for Syrian refugees and some are in general for newcomers, but also with a focus very much on, on refugees that are being resettled. So here's some examples. The Game Changer program for youth, for example, is a program that many young um, refugees go into right away when they arrive. Uh, it's a pr wonderful program because they learn about uh, workplace practices and soft skills in Canadian workplaces uh, and also hard skills like resume writing, cover letters, while being paid. So they are being paid paid for that program. There is a specific program for women, the Work for Women program. This is specifically for women newcomers. And then there's one example of one of the Syrian specific programs we had at the time, which was a collaboration with the BC manufacturing sector. And we teamed up to provide um, job training and then also you know, jobs at the end of the training for Syrian refugees interested in that sector. Next slide. So often we are being asked, you know, what is success uh, for, for newcomers, especially refugee newcomers? What does it mean that they are now established in a new society? And I think often there is this focus on employment. So the minute they're employed, you know, they are seen as a success story. And if they are not employed, maybe less so. But I think this is a very narrow uh, understanding of success and of integration and of establishment. Um, I mean, there are so many people that have uh, done very well in different ways. Um, sometimes it's with their children. You know, I hear stories from former sponsors about, you know, children that were accepted in scholarship programs that are really academically uh, performing very, very well. Um, but one of the, the things that I want to highlight really is also, and I think that's one of the biggest success stories, the significant number of people that have already received their Canadian citizenship five years or less you know, after arriving in Canada. We, we know that the, the uptake of citizenship amongst refugees in Canada is very high, and that's not any different for a year in Victoria. Uh, I do not have con concrete statistics on that, but I do hear that very often, either from former sponsors or from the refugees themselves who sent me a message and say, hey, I just got my citizenship. So this is really great that Canada Canada provides that opportunity uh, to, to get citizenship in a fa fairly quickly, you know, compared to some other jurisdictions, because that gives people that extra sense of safety and security, and of course also allows them, if the situation improves at some point in the future in their home country, to, to go back for a visit. Next slide. So we must not forget, of course, um, at the same time that many Syrians, and I think that was uh, very well illustrated by the previous speakers, have experienced very much trauma in the past that might still be affecting them today. So this can affect them over many, many years to come. Um, the, we speak with the newcomers about professional uh, assistance that's available there. And I want to mention in particular here in Victoria, the Vancouver Island Counseling Center for Immigrants and Refugees that has been a wonderful part partner, you know, in making these professional supports available. But some people, um, they don't quite need that. They just need, you know, some extra outlets where they can sort of uh, channel, you know, some, some of the issues that they're working through and dealing with. So we are offering, for example, art classes, uh, yoga classes, even now online, you know, through the pandemic, we have been able to continue these things. And that's sometimes uh, sufficient for people to just kind of channel, you know, these, these 
traumatic experiences through some creative activity and, and deal with them that way. But if the professional supports are needed, then, then they, are, they are available. Next slide, please. So yeah, just to highlight again the importance of these community partnerships. I've already um, noted the, the Vancouver Island Counseling Center for Immigrants and Refugees. It does take a whole of community effort to make people feel at home in a new place and to help people you know, really settle down in a new place. Uh, there are many, many others that we worked with over the years. Um, so faith organizations like the local mosque here, uh, educational organizations, that have provided additional language learning options and scholarships to Syrian refugees, uh, discounts that many local businesses have provided and dental health providers. I mean, just to name a few of those. And then of course, there were equally many informal community initiatives that, that kind of self-organized uh, where individuals just took the initiative. So there were people who offered a warehousing space for storage and exchange of furniture for newcomers, artisans, and craft circles that formed to make items for newcomers and later with newcomers as they had established themselves. So these were all part and parcel of the settlement and integration process. Uh, next slide. So just a few words about uh, the impact of the pandemic. Um, so Obviously, it has had an impact on refugees and Syrian refugees, just like it has had on, on other people, on all of us. Uh, the newcomers that arrived closer to uh, the various lockdowns or whatever you want to call that uh, were more challenged than those that came earlier. Those that came earlier uh, were more likely to have already had stable employment at the time, you know, when the pandemic hit. And they were therefore more likely to have had access to government benefits associated with the pandemic such as the SERP and, and others. Um, and the ones that came close to the pandemic or during the pandemic, so we did have people arriving last year, of course, also struggled more to have interactions with uh, the formal and the informal support systems. So in my case, in my program in particular with the sponsors, you know, who of course had to distance and do all the follow all the, the regular health, um, public health procedures. Uh, it was more difficult for them to think about applying for jobs, even searching for jobs. Um, and they sometimes felt more isolated. You especially if they arrived alone and uh, you know didn't have the support of, of family members that, that they were living with. Uh, but we have continued with our programming. So as you can see, a classroom down here physically distanced now. So we, you know, we went to a, a blend between online and in-person learning. We offered a lot more um, uh, programming online in virtual spaces. You can see that there. We offered classes for people to learn how to engage in physical spaces, Zoom classes, and we have a digital digital uh, skills facilitator now at ICA uh, who is actually an Arabic speaker and who can help people with, with that uh, linguistic background. Um, next slide. Thank you. So, Sometimes we are asked how long it takes for a person to feel fully settled and integrated. And I find it always difficult to answer that question because it's it's a very personal journey, which differs from person to person. And also, you know, a person who has lost everything will most likely, and I say most likely because I'm not, I cannot put myself in the shoes of a person who has gone through this. I do not have lived experience as a refugee, so I need to acknowledge that. But I imagine that a person who has gone through this will never feel fully at ease in their new society, regardless of how successful they, they are on the surface. So I think this is important to acknowledge. But I also have to say that I see many signs in people and I've put these faces here. These are all people, you know, these are our own photographs of people that we have worked with um, that indicate that they're what I call on the road to contentment. So while this is obviously not the life they were hoping to have with their families, um, they are making the best of it. And next slide. I'm almost done. I know we want to get to our questions. So um, I think this is really important because many people told us that they really came to Canada for their children so that the children could have a good life. They were often torn between staying in a situation of displacement, like in a place like Turkey or in Lebanon, uh, that kept them close to other family members 
and on the other hand, thinking about giving their children a better future. And they opted for the children, but that meant they had to make the heart-wrenching decision to leave other family members behind and might not see them for a long time, if ever again. And um, so it's it's really, this is one of the reasons why we're seeing what we call this echo effect, you know, where people that came to Canada as resettled refugees are now uh, looking for help to bring other family members to Canada that, that were left behind. And this is what very much fuels, you know, the private sponsorship program where we on, on an ongoing basis are looking for more people that are willing to be engaged and help those that came here earlier to bring, bring other loved ones. Um, and then my last slide, please. Can you go to the last slide, Chris? So just to maybe the one before. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So um, just, I, I'm just showing this to say that, you know, sometimes people think about the Syrian resettlement to Canada as a, as a historic event, like a moment in time that happened in 2015, 16. But, but for those of us that are working on a daily basis with these newcomers, the, the refugee movement uh, is far from over. So uh, as I said, you know, people uh, are looking for sponsorship for other family members. Um, my, some people might still be receiving settlement supports. Of course, that declines over time, the need for those supports as people are, are you know, more able to navigate their communities. Um, but for us, a large scale resettlement initiative is never just a moment in time. There are always ongoing repercussions from that, often for years or even for, for decades to come. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. So we have a lot of time. Thank you for listening. And I'm very happy to answer questions. Thank you, Sabina. I noticed on one of your art class uh, posters, on the art class poster, you had a, a man with a guitar, and I immediately thought of uh, Stephen. Um, There's a nice tie-in, actually, there. Um, but let's go on to the Q&A, and if you do have uh, questions for the audience, we do have uh, the Q&A uh, button down below, and if you want to put questions in the chat, that's that's fine as well. I'd actually like to, to start with Bassam with uh, a question of, of my own. Uh, a couple of things, really. I mean, I have heard that every day in Turkey, um, 500 Syrian children are, are born to uh, the refugees that are there, and uh, that they're stateless. Um, Turkey doesn't grant them citizenship. The Syrian authorities in, in Syria, of course, that's a broken relationship. So you, you have that issue. Um, so what might happen? Uh, what might happen to them? And then the second question I had for you, if you could give us a, a sort of brief overview, where does the Syrian opposition, the, the political opposition sit now with the situation in Syria? Uh, okay, Chris. Uh, so first question regarding the children born in Turkey. Uh, we have to highlight that Turkey started granting citizenship as discretionary. So uh, basically they select the people which they grant citizenship to. They will focus on those with uh, more education. And the numbers are not really uh, clear, uh, not, not uh, declared fully, uh, but assumptions are there are anywhere between 130,000 to 200,000. Of course, that's a very small segment of the entire refugee population, it doesn't solve uh, many uh, problems. Uh, and now, for those born here, there are two ways. First, they get the protection status, so they have protection card with their information and the Turkish birth certificate, but that's all. No actual citizenship. Uh, the second option where some Syrians still uh, find themselves forced to go to the Syrian embassy or in Ankara or consulate in, in Istanbul to obtain uh, some kind of documentations, papers, it's not easy. And in a way, it's uh, problematic because they find themselves escaping from this regime at the same time have to fund this regime. Uh, by paying the fees and uh, go into the embassy with a picture of Assad on the wall and uh, staff which are rude to them and, and so on and so on. So majority end with, uh, with no actual citizenship. They just uh, basically Turkish birth certificate and protection uh, certificate. There have been talks at some point of 
the government wanting to give uh, those people citizenship, but it's not easy as the law does not state that. So they have to go again under this discretionary status with their parents and which will put big numbers. And I think the government always worried here that uh, such an action will be politicized during elections by and utilized by other parties. Therefore, uh, it just stays as it is for, for now, at least. So, uh, sorry, Chris, your second question was? So it's the it's the, the Syrian, opposition. yeah, the Syrian opposition, yeah. and uh, you know it's been a long period now. And is there, I mean, I don't sense that there's any real hope um, for a change in Syria in the near future. So how are you? How is the Syrian opposition occupying their time at this point? Um, okay, here we have to do, uh, differentiate basically between the opposition as a broad term which include many groups, many NGOs, many political parties, and so on, and the official opposition. The official opposition basically is, to big level, is powerless uh, to act on the refugee situation. It's much larger than its capacity, and uh, it has its own problems. But uh, overall, if we talk about the broader opposition, the uh, majority of work with refugees have been done by NGOs uh, which oppose the regime. Uh, which don't work with the Syrian government. Uh, so majority of work in Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey has been done by those NGOs in terms of education, healthcare, uh, uh, even aid uh, and uh, vocational training. A lot of this, of course, uh, has been supported by international NGOs and agencies, uh, but implemented by Syrian uh, opposition NGOs. Thank you for that. Um, Stephen, I have a question uh, for you uh, that's, that's come in. And it, um, it referred to your, your, your time when you arrived uh, on uh, Lesbos. And uh, from, your, from your book, I think I know the answer to this, but you arrived, but, but there was no real setup for you. You had to make your own way, I think, and just try to fit in. Could you explain how, what it was like you arrive in Lesbos and what happened the, the, the moment you were there? What happened the, you know, in the next five minutes? How did you find your way on that island? Oh, and you're on mute. How many times has that happened since the Zoom webinar started? Today? Okay, so um, in the 48 hours before I left Canada and flew to Greece, I emailed a few people, uh, including a woman who lives on Lesbos, uh, an old friend. Well, we were partners a long time ago. And I said, you must be involved. Uh, I, I knew she would be, what's going on? She said, no, I'm not there, but here are people you can contact. They've started a volunteer foundation. So the vol volunteer foundation I ended up joining uh, immediately after arriving, the day I arrived, had only been in existence for two months. And this gives you a sense of the kind of chaos, the sort of molten state that was, uh, <clears throat> that was in place on Lesbos at that point. Uh, up to on uh, one day, 6,000 refugees in October one day arrived, mainly Syrian, in one day. Uh, and there's 70 NGOs all scrambling around, uh, sometimes fighting for power, mainly just trying to help. And then there's several volunteer groups. So I joined one of the volunteer groups. And the night I joined, uh, they realized that most of the volunteers were away from the harbor up in the Oxy camp, which was this volunteer run camp in the parking lot of a closed nightclub. And so Tracy, who, who ran the volunteer organization, said, Steve, can you help on the dock right now? Unexpectedly, the weather's terrible. We didn't expect any rafts to be crossing, but one raft set out and it, it, it's sinking. It has sunk. The Coast Guard have rescued them. They're bringing these people in. Will you help? So what I ended up doing, I was this ad hoc customs agent. They made me sit down at a table or one Arabic translator took the passports of the Syrians, sorry, uh, took the, uh, recorded the ID of the Syrians who did not have passports because he could speak to them in Arabic. He took down their details. I was receiving passports, uh, fortunately for me, written in you know, Roman script. Uh, and um, I had to write down the names, the fa father name as it was written on, called, called on this form the Greek police had given us. Uh, you know, and I, I felt really awkward being a customs agent, but they had to be registered before they could be given dry clothing and food and taken to the camp. So I was still jet lagged and I was operating as a sort of customs agent. I was wearing a leather jacket, jeans and a fedora and I have an earring. And the refugees who walked up to me and found themselves handing their passports 
many of them wrapped in uh, saran wrap over and over again to protect them from the water. Uh, they were looking at me in disbelief, like, what kind of cus what kind of country have we come to? What kind of customs agent is this? I was tipping my hat and uh, trying to say the one Arabic phrase I'd been in taught 20 minutes before, you know, uh, wassalam alaikum, you know, or, or merhaba, merhaba, welcome. I just felt like a complete fool, but that's, the, that's what was happening. It was such chaos. We were getting thrown in to do any job. Uh, and later that night, I had to guide them to a bus and I got lost because I didn't know the town. So that was the kind of chaos I was immediately immersed in. It felt like being on the front lines of a war, except the danger was to them, not to me. It was, I was in no, in no physical danger, but the chaos felt like the front line uh, in a battle. I think that's one of the most um, um, compelling uh, stories actually in the, in the book, um, because in some respects we've all been there, but you, there you are guiding refugees, I think in the dark, if I recall, and dark. you're not even sure where you're going. You're not even sure where you're going. And they're kind of wondering, do you know where you're going? And, and I, I could feel them uh, and hear them losing confidence. Now, of course, they were speaking in Arabic. There, there were in that group of 60 people. There were no English speakers, I, I asked, and nobody could. So uh, they're all families. And I could just hear them increasingly murmuring as I led them farther and farther into the dark. <laughs> where, where the hell is this guy taking us in his fedora and his leather jacket? Uh, and eventually, uh, we eventually we found the bus that was waiting to take them down to the dreaded Camp Moria. But it was terrifying for me because I thought these people are tired, hungry, and cold. And I, with every step, I may be leading them farther away into the darkness. I thought, mm -hmm. wow, it's, it was terrifying. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder, um, having having spent the time there, you you come back. Um, many people can have uh, they can develop post-traumatic stress disorder just even after brief encounters. How did you feel when you came back to Canada um, after, after being there? Did you feel like you needed to go back? Um, how did you move away from it or have you moved away from it? Uh, one thing I've noted is that human beings have this capacity for habituation and it's both good and bad. It's a survival instinct, it's a survival adaptation. So for the Syrians in Camp Moria, uh, there were 20,000 of them at one point living in small tents or in sea cans. <clears throat> and I saw, I saw plenty of photographs and some video of, and, them, and they were getting on with their lives and they were, they'd grown used to the place they were. They didn't like it, they wanted to leave, but they made the best of it. So that capacity, that survival instinct, that ability to habituate to even the worst situation is a wonderful thing in some ways. It helps people survive. The negative side of it, is that when you are not encountering a hardship or seeing it in front of you, other people's hardship in front of you, you quickly habituate to your privilege and luxury. So I found to my distress that within a few weeks of returning to Canada, I was just used to not seeing these things, not even some days, not even thinking about it, even though I'd been there only two weeks before. Mm -hmm. And I say that with a kind of, um, with, uh, you know, in sorrow. Uh, and yet it's true. And I think it's true. I don't think I'm hard hearted. I think it's true of a lot of people. We need someone to remind us every morning when we wake up uh, th that we need to feel grateful if we're not in that position of hardship and that many other people still are uh, even now. I mean, the situation hasn't changed. And yes, mm -hmm. I do think of going back, but you can't um, you can't go as a volunteer anymore. You have to be attached to an NGO. I think your 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 book, which we have, and uh, your your book for children, which I I bought for my niece, uh, is one way of contributing to the story uh, that you you carry on contributing to the story and informing people. So let me just say thank you, uh, thank you for that. And I just like to oh, do you want to answer? Just before you ask yeah. Sabina a question, I just wanted to recommend a book by a Syrian writer. A children's book by Syrian right now. He, he, of course, he knows Syria. He knows Syrian children. He knows the crisis because he was in the middle of it. His name is Jamal Sayed, and he wrote a book called Yara's Spring. And uh, if you like my book, I, I'm happy to hear it. But if you want a book that authentically uh, views the crisis from the point of view of a young Syrian girl who has to flee with her family, uh, it's one of the most powerful. It's the most powerful children's book I've ever read. I wrote a brief review of it about a month ago, uh, Yara's Spring. It's published by Enoch Press. And that's where you get a really authentic vision of, of what, what has happened. Heartbreaking. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, it doesn't really hit you until you see it for yourself sometimes. Uh, I can recall being on the Syrian border and watching families come across, uh, usually uh, women with young children, they're dragging whatever they can and the Turkish authorities are trying to you know, get people organized and welcoming them. And, and you know, it, it, that's when it really strikes you that this is real and, and you're, you're seeing it. Um, uh, Sabina, one thing I wanted to ask you about is we know that refugees were grouped into, you know, two uh, area, two, two groups, if you like, those that had private sponsorship, those that were government sponsored. And I, I have read that uh, sometimes the government sponsored Syrian refugees have had challenges. They haven't had that support network for them. How does that play out in Victoria? Is 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 there a, is there a big difference, or does some does do organizations like the ICA try to bridge that gap? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think sometimes almost too much attention is being paid to the differences between these two groups. Whereas in reality, you know, they come from the same population, they all come with the same hopes and dreams and aspirations and desires and needs. So um, in, in Victoria, I think I said earlier that ICA does both programs. So we're involved in both programs. So we are funded for our government assisted refugee program, which is called the RAP Resettlement Assistance Program. And so those refugees that come in that program, they have very tight supports during the first six to eight weeks through a dedicated team of professionals that look after their needs in terms of housing, temporary, then permanent housing, you know, make sure that all of the many bureaucratic pieces are taken care of when you come in into a new country and then they transition them uh, to our ICA settlement team after those initial few weeks for ongoing supports. We um, do also have a community connections program. So this is basically a fancy word for a volunteer program where uh, newcomers that do not have sponsors that are not in the private sponsorship program uh, can be attached to a person you know, that will provide some additional supports if, if they need tighter supports. Um, but the, the other thing that happened was that in some cases, ordinary Canadians, like neighbors, you know, of people that knew that a family had moved into their neighborhood and they started talking to them and they started supporting them in a variety of ways, you know, so they became kind of informal, uh, an informal support structure. Um, I think I think the jury is out as to whether one program is better than another. I think it's, it's a false kind of dichotomy and it's kind of a false comparison to make. I mean, some, some refugees I know really, really appreciate the fact that they have these tight supports from sponsors and they interact all the time and they call the sponsors all the time. And other people actually I've heard saying that, you know, they were quite happy uh, being more independent in the sense that they were supported by these formal government supports and didn't need to feel like they were private people, you know, that were making that first year in Canada a possibility for them. I would say it's very much a personal preference. Of course, the refugees are generally not given that preference, that, that choice of preference. You know, they come under whichever pathway. But at the end of the day, I know there are studies done uh, by the government. As I said, they always measure employment and income because that's easy to measure, right, quantitatively. And so there are some studies done that maybe, you know, one category finds employment faster than the other category. But you can't really compare compare it that way either because you know the, the, in the private sponsorship program there are referrals that family members are making so many of those refugees have family connections and have those extra psychosocial supports over time we know that even on the economic side of things things really converge you know and after so many years there are no differences uh, like measurable quantitative differences in income or anything like that between the various streams I did have one other question for you uh, from Alex, and you know we do have refugees coming from all over, and and how does you know he's asking really how do you prioritize? And I also um, am concerned about what's happening in Afghanistan, and if we'll see another uh, wave of refugees uh, leaving mm -hmm. Afghanistan. And I know Turkey has some almost half a million uh, Afghanis uh, there, and and so what um how do you how do you prioritize or is it just on a situational basis mm -hmm. 
That's a really good question. So in the government assisted program, all of the refugees that are referred to Canada under that program are referred by the UN Refugee Agency. Well, there's one other referral agency, but it's a very small number. So it's mostly the UN Refugee Agency. So our government, government of Canada, you know, uh, enters into multi year commitments with the UN Refugee Agency and will say over the next, you know, three years, we'll resettle X number of people from this nationality. And then, of course, they're also looking at the various categories of, uh, you know, that that play into resettlement decision by the UN refugee agency. So there's a number of categories of vulnerability, like survivors of torture, people with, you know, severe medical conditions, and so on and so forth. So they will also say we will take, you know, so many people with medical situations, so many, you know, survivors of torture, so many of this. So that is in the in the um, in the government assisted program. So there is no prioritization on our part. It's it's really the government of Canada together with the UN Refugee Agency that makes this prioritization. On the private sponsorship side, it's completely different because we basically can refer whoever we want to the Canadian government for sponsorship as long as they meet the definition of being a refugee. And so different sponsorship agreement holders in Canada have different criteria. Um, I typically, we, you know, ICA does not discriminate at all on the basis of religion or nationality, like any of these criteria. For me, it's really about the question, um, you know, what situation is that that person or that family in? Do they have any other kind of pathway? Do they have any any other kind of way, you know, to get out of that situation. And then, of course, is the sponsorship group able to provide the required supports? So it's basically a decision, not just about the refugee and their situation, but also about, you know, is the sponsorship group able to provide the supports? all things being equal, right? If I had two cases in front of me and I needed to make a decision and uh, it was very clear that the one refugee um, or family was in a much more dire situation than the other uh, family, that's probably where I would, you know, make my priority decision. But there's a lot of different criteria that, that go into that. And you're absolutely right, you know, and one of one of the uh, pieces with the private sponsorship program is that because the sponsors need to come up with all the money, the, the the older the people are in the family that you sponsor, the more money it costs. Uh, that just has to do with you know uh, that these rates are linked to social income assistance rates and all of this. And unfortunately, and this is a very sad aspect of. Um, the private sponsorship program that often those people in these long term protracted refugee situations kind of age out of a viable sponsorship right when I when I have to tell sponsors the sponsorship is going to cost you 60 or $70,000 for that year, you can imagine that you know not everyone is in a position to to fundraise that kind of money. Thank you for that and I see we're coming close to the end. And I want to give the last word to uh, Bassam uh, because I did have a question for you about your Royal Roads experience, your your master's degree at Royal Roads, and how has that helped you in your day-to-day uh, -day work that you're doing now? Uh, okay, first of all, I need to mention that uh, it took me the two years program. It took me seven years because I started uh, at the beginning of the Syrian Revolution, so. Uh, I came here to Turkey thinking that I'm coming here for six months and going back and here I am now at the eighth year. Uh, now it helped me mainly understand uh, the, uh, how the other people thinking, the other side of the conflict, uh, people who I don't share maybe the same thoughts, ideas with. Uh, so it, it was really useful for me uh, to be able to see that, to uh, even I did my uh, thesis about the Alawites in Syria and how they think, how they see the conflict. And a lot of my Alawite uh, writers, friends helped me actually with some of their writings, some unpublished writings and so on. Uh, so it, it was key actually to understanding the conflict uh, and key as well to thinking of how it could be resolved at some day or how it should be resolved maybe uh, and unfortunately the situation now is outside of the syrian hands it's mostly among uh, 
the big players. Uh, but anyhow, it, it was really useful. Thank you, uh, Bassam. And I do see that we're at the end of our 90 minutes. It's flown by. And it's always a great privilege uh, for me uh, just to be able to host something like this and to, to connect with uh, you, Bassam, and Stephen, and uh, Sabina here uh, to bring us all together to talk about something that we've all touched on or deeply involved in some way uh, in the past and, and of course now uh, as well for for you as well, um, just to have that opportunity. And, and uh, I'd also like to thank all the audience to, that has joined us today, because I know that many of you out there have uh, either could be from Syria, you could be here in Canada, you've helped Syrian refugees, you've been involved on the diplomatic side as well. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure of that we all have an interest about um, this, because of course it's important for our country as well and where we go uh, in the future. So thank you. Uh, panelists. Thank you, participants. And before I do close, I just wanted to mention a couple of things that we do have coming up. We have a wide range of uh, events here at CIC Victoria and in CIC in general. But just for us in our local branch, uh, we have Brenda Shope uh, next week talking about the universal challenges to food systems and the role that uh, Canada can play. Uh, we have Jeremy Seal. Uh, on the 12th of May, talking about his new book. It's called A Coup in Turkey. So, Bassam, you might be interested in this, but it actually goes back to Adnan Menderes in the 1960 coup. And then he, uh, the author, draws parallels to the situation we see in uh, Turkey today. We have David Carmet uh, coming at the end of May to talk about Canada among nations. Uh, how we should see ourselves in the future. And finally, uh, one thing I'm really excited about on the 8th of June, or maybe the 9th or 10th, we still have to figure out the exact date, but we'll have uh, Ambassador uh, Jennifer May, who is our ambassador to Brazil. And she will be talking about the uh, political situation in, in Brazil, of course, and Canada-Brazil relations. And uh, it's something that we often don't focus on, but but it's time we do. And so we have her, her coming. So uh, that's just a little idea of what's coming up. And so if you're not a CIC member, um, please consider joining us because we could always use your support. And so it's 1031, we're a minute over, uh, but thank you everybody. And to the panelists, I will be touching base with you after the event. And uh, it's been a real delight. Thank you again to the audience and uh, have a great day wherever you are. Thank you.